Hi, I'm Clark on Temptress, and today we're gonna to talk about wire. What is it, how big should you choose, and how do you keep it from burning down your boat? This video is part of an electrical series. We're gonna eventually get into some really useful methods of figuring out electrical problems. We're going to go off into how to wire your boat, how to draw a wiring schematic, how to decide how all that should be. But to do that, we need another building block. Today, we're going to talk about wire. How to choose wire, what happens when you choose the wrong wire, and how to protect the wire from burning down your boat. Last episode, we went into Ohm's Law, pretty darn deep. If you didn't watch it, you might want to watch it. It is a very important equation, and it talked about what happens when current is passing through a wire that has some resistance. That's what we use as our example anyway. Now let's talk a little more about wire. In a nutshell, wire is the pathway that electrons can follow through a circuit. They are how you can get the power out of your battery and maybe into your radio, for example. There's a lot of different wires available, particularly lately. Historically, um, most wire was copper, and it should be copper. Barring silver, um, copper is really good. But watch with the wire you're buying. Nowadays, aluminum is cheaper and they're making aluminum wire. Now, aluminum wire can be used, but for a given size, its resistance is much higher. Also, it melts at a lower temperature, I believe. And most importantly, when the wire corrodes, it makes an aluminum oxide finish that is very high in resistance. And in short, it has no reason to be on a boat. So, Always check that it, the wire you buy is pure copper. Um, China puts out some wire, they're a little sneaky about it, and it looks like copper, and they call it copper. It's copper clad aluminum. It's just dusted with copper. Um, so make sure it's copper. Uh, usually it, if it says 100% copper, that's the magic word for it really being copper. So copper wire. Second thing. What's the wire like inside the insulator? This one, well, you can't see it, but this one is stranded. And stranded wire, here's a piece of it here too, has a lot of little wires all in a bundle, like this. Now, household wire, what you would use to wire up your house, has one solid core of copper. It's basically a copper bar with insulation over the outside of it. On boats or cars or anything that moves, anything that vibrates, you want to use this stranded stuff. Now, technically, it doesn't move power as well, and technically, it'll corrode more easily. Lots more surface area, right? But it's flexible. You, I could do this a million times, and it's not going to fail. If I did this with Romex, the wire you have in your house, if I did it 30 times, it'd probably break right off inside. And the last thing you want is your wire breaking. First off, it's a hassle. Second off, where it breaks, it can like start sparking and arcing and causing a lot of heat. And uh, we don't want hot spots in our boat. That starts fires. Another thing that's changed recently is what the wire is uh, coated with. Now, it's always been this vinyl plastic stuff and it works just fine. There's no problem with it. But an option that's available now is this, and you, you can't tell, but if you were touching this, you would feel it's very different. This is a, a silicon coated wire, and I've been buying it lately. It's just a pleasure to work with. I particularly use it in things that I actually have to handle, like test probes for electronic equipment and stuff. But it's not prohibitively expensive, and it tends to also come with uh, finer strands of wire inside. Again, making it much more flexible. Let's see, another thing. If you notice, this wire doesn't particularly look coppery, but I'm telling you, it's pure copper. It's actually been coated with tin, uh, basically dipped in a teeny, teeny amount of solder. And that tinned wire doesn't corrode as easily as copper. 
A lot of wire that's used on boats is this tin copper, and it's worth it. Um, wire sometimes gets watered that'll go up inside it, and it'll corrode way up inside the shield, and this tin wire just doesn't corrode as quickly. Remember, corro corrosion is our worst enemy on a boat. Final thing about wire, and probably the most important part about wire, is its size. Now, in the United States, we use something called American Wire Gauge, AWG. In Europe, and I guess much of the rest of the metric world nowadays, um, it's square millimeters of cross-sectional area is how it's rated. I'm going to talk in AWG because, well, that's what I'm used to, and that's what all this wire is, uh, American Wire Gauge. Everybody that's watching this video has access to Google. Just type in AWG space MM2, and you'll find a chart that'll convert what I'm saying to what you can buy locally. Uh, if I try to say both all the time, I'll just get confused, you'll get confused, and <laughs> we don't want that. So, wire comes in different size. This is 12 gauge. 12 gauge is kind of my backbone wire. This is all I used for anything on the boat until recently. Anything small, hook up. If I have to run a radio or something, I'll use 12 gauge wire. If I have to run a shared circuit a long distance, I might step up to 10. And if I'm running some special purpose things that are going to pass some real amps, then I go to big wire. But I never went below 12. Well, I've changed my mind on that for one reason. LED lights. They use so little power, you can get away with something like this. I think this is maybe 18 or 20 gauge, but if you're just running a couple of LEDs, you can do the power math and you'll find that there's very little voltage drop using very small wire and it's easier to pull it through the walls, easier to conceal it, and honestly, it's a lot cheaper. So, this is 12 gauge wire. If you get onto Google as well, you can look up the limits. Um, and you'll find tables that will say something like, this wire can handle 20 um, amps. Well, that's a rule of thumb. Any wire up to a point can, hire, can handle most anything, but it will have a voltage drop. So we go back to Ohm's law, because we're gonna do this right. And we can figure out how much, how much voltage it would drop and whether we accept that in the circuit. Um, I think of 20 amps on a 12 gauge wire is just kind of like the top end of what you should go to. In fact, at that point, the wire is making heat. If you need to push more power, you go to a bigger gauge wire. This is two gauge wire, and wire goes much, much bigger. Uh, for your, Again, for you Europeans, the American wire gauge is like gauges of anything. As the number gets smaller, the thing gets bigger. It's a, a fraction of a pound, I think it came from originally. Um, so two gauge wire, I find I use an awful lot on the boat for hooking up inverters and things like that. And then for the main battery connections, um, I go up to double aught very often. And again, that's uh, gonna be strange to you Europeans. So what happens if you go absolutely crazy and you put way too much power through a given wire? Well, to really know what's going on there, I'm going to introduce another equation. We had Ohm's Law last time. That's the one that associates voltage with current and resistance. Now, another really handy equation, and just as simple, three terms again, is the power equation. And it comes down to this. Power equals volts times current. Now, we measure power in watts, and you're all familiar with watts, like it used to be 100 watt light bulbs and 25 watt light bulbs. Uh, that's a light bulb that consumes that much power. And how it works is there's an amount of electricity available, a voltage, a amount of current is allowed to pass through the little filament, and there's a voltage drop across that filament. And if you multiply the current that passes by the voltage drop, um, you get a number of watts. So a 100 watt light bulb is one that was calibrated so that when it was hooked right up to the mains, it would pass 100 watts. And that 100 watts is a way of measuring electricity, but it's also a way of measuring heat. 
Uh, you've probably seen space heaters rated in watts, hair dryers are in watts. Well, that heat made the filament really, really hot, and it got to the point where it actually incandesced the carbon that was on it. And when carbon incandesces at those very high temperatures, it gives off light and it gives off that color of light. If you use a wire that's too small, again, heat develops inside the wire. And we can go back to our earlier work and figure out the voltage drop. If you multiply that voltage drop by the um, current that you, is passing, you'll get the number of watts of heat that are being generated in that wire. The examples I gave last uh, episode were very small watt numbers, and that heat just dissipated into the environment. What happens though if you break that rule? You have a huge voltage drop because you have high resistance and you try to pass a whole lot of current. Um, what'll happen? Well, let's find out. I have some props here. I have a battery and uh, a little aside on this battery. If you want a video about this, I'll do one. Uh, this has proved to be very handy. This is um, a knockoff of a Pelican box. It's a waterproof box. People use it for cameras and sensitive equipment. Inside we have some lithium iron phosphate cells. A nice circuit breaker that will let me shut it off, but it also would pop if I tried to draw too much power. Um, under here are the support circuitries that keep this from uh, being harmed too badly if I abuse it. And I have a little place here. Sometimes I put an inverter in here if we might need some power remotely. Um, Emily uses this battery pack for her little dinghy when she has an electric motor on it. And she puts her VHF radio in here, so she has a waterproof box for that. Anyway, we have a lot of power available to us here. And I've rigged up this little circuit. I have a switch, and I have short circuited this right between negative and positive through the switch. And since there's going to be some heat, let's get some ceramic out to protect us. I'm going to run a lot of current through this little green wire. This is 24 gauge and it's going to cause a lot of voltage drop because it has a lot of resistance per foot. It's going to try to pass as much current as it's being asked for in this circuit, which is a lot. I can't exactly calculate it, but it's going to be up around 50 amps and interesting things are going to happen. And I'll be interested too, because this is not exactly the kind of thing you want to do twice on your boat. So I'm doing this live. Um, we have a fire extinguisher ready and Emily's at the ready to uh, try to save me if things go bad. So here goes. And I fully expect the switch to not be able to be used again after this. So I'm going to turn it on and watch. That's it. That was interesting. <laughs> a little smoke. Well, what happened? Let's think about that. Um, the copper got seriously hot. Seriously quick. I thought it would take a little longer, quite honestly. Uh, it melted its insulation off. It uh, fused. It burnt little holes in itself and fell apart. Well, if that happened and that was down inside uh, the, the wood of Temptress, you know, through a cabinet somewhere, that could start a fire. If it was a little longer and slower process, maybe if the wire was a tad longer, uh, so there'd be less current, or the wire was a little bigger, so there'd be less voltage drop, it could hold that heat for a very long time and start a fire. And you really don't want a fire on a boat. Um, you can be on a boat in a situation where your choices are burning or drowning, and there's no other choice. You either stay with the boat or you jump into the ocean mid-ocean. So we never allow anything dangerous. Um, again, as an aside, those are lithium iron phosphate batteries. Personally, I won't have lithium ion batteries on my boat of any size, little teeny ones maybe. And I'm a little nervous about my electric drill, quite honestly. But lithium iron phosphate is way, way, way safer. But we'll talk about batteries in another video. We want to control the amount of current that goes through a circuit. The main way of controlling the amount of current is to have the load, the thing that's doing the work, not draw more power than it should. But things go bad. Sometimes 
uh, devices fail in a way where they draw a whole bunch of power. Sometimes a wire comes loose and if it's a hot wire, it might touch your engine or some other big grounded thing and cause a short circuit. And that can go very bad as we saw in our example. So how do you protect that? Well, you do it with a fuse. You do it with a lot of ways, but let's talk about the fuse first because a fuse is the simplest to understand and honestly, it's the most reliable. We call a fuse a fuse. It kind of stands for a fused link. So this would go into the circuit, usually very near the power source, very near the battery, and it would um, fail if too much current passes through it. The idea is you want this to fail first. So it's got two things going for it. It has a small conductor inside that's calibrated to melt when too much current is passed, whatever its rating is. And it has something around it to contain the heat that's generated, in this case, a uh, glass tube. So you've all seen these fuses before, I'm sure, but fuses come in all different styles. Uh, these are a little bit stouter things and they are rated for huge voltages. Uh, they're used in my multimeter. Um, you, we also have something called circuit breakers. And a circuit breaker is much like a fuse, except it's more of a switch that gets kicked over if too much current passes through. And you get a chance to redeem yourself, reset the circuit breaker once you fix the problem and try again. Uh, they come in lots of styles. This one pops up when uh, it goes bad and you just push it in to reset it. This one is uh, like a switch as well as being a circuit breaker. So it becomes a switch you can turn on and off or if too much current passes through it, bang, it'll turn itself off. Both fuses and circuit breakers are current limiting devices. If too much current tries to pass through them, they will say, not on my watch, either by burning out permanently and have to be replaced or by tripping themselves and turning themselves off so that once you fix the problem, you can reset them. Now, how would you use something like this? And what are you protecting with it? Obviously, you're protecting your boat. I said that. What people think they're protecting with a fuse very often is the device. If I had a VHF radio and I was protecting it with, let's say, this fuse here. So I'd show you another style. This is the automotive plug-in kind. Well, you've seen those. If I put this in the lead to my radio and I put it in an appropriate size fuse, I am not protecting the radio. If something goes wrong with the radio, it's going to destroy itself and there's nothing that the fuse is going to do about it because it can actually be destroyed with tiny amounts of power if you got water in it, for example. What the fuse is protecting is the wire. Why would we want to protect the wire? Well, because the wire is what will burn down your boat if things go bad. So fuses protect wires. You need to have a fuse or a fusible link of some kind, circuit breaker, protecting every wire and it should be appropriate to the size of the wire. So if you were to have a large wire coming out of your battery, very near the battery, you might have a large circuit breaker. This case, is, this one's a 100 amp circuit breaker. Um, I'm not doing the math. I just happen to have a 100 amp in my hand. Um, and that protects that wire because basically you've already done the, um, the decision making to decide that this wire can handle 100 amps without it becoming a problem. If you go from this wire in some little terminal block somewhere, maybe your power panel to a bunch of smaller wires, each of these sub circuits needs another circuit breaker that's smaller, that's appropriately sized for the wire that's going on the rest of the route. So remember that, if I leave you with nothing else today, fuses protect wires, and a fuse has to be sized to be no larger than what you can pass through the lowest, smallest wire that's down of it, that's beyond it. Okay, so you have a device, and you want to install it on your boat, and you want to wire it up, and you're saying to yourself, what size wire do I use? Now, we went over the math of how to calculate that yourself based on your own needs. You can be a full-on engineer using the other video. Let's say you're lazy. You don't want to be a full-on engineer. 
Well, there's tables for this. There's a lot of shortcuts available. There's tables that will tell you that 12 gauge wire is good to 20 amps. Now there's a bunch of voltage drop before you get there, but it would work and it wouldn't burn down your boat. You try to put 40 amps through something, you've really gone too far. And again, Google's your friend. Just type in wire size, amperage, and you will find a table very quickly that will answer those questions. Usually the tables come in a couple flavors. Like there might be one that says, if you use this amperage through this wire, you're gonna get a 10% voltage drop. And then another table beside it saying, if you use this lower amount of amps through this table, you'll get 3% voltage drop. So that's a really quick and easy way of applying Ohm's law without actually knowing Ohm's law. Usually more copper is better, uh, less voltage drop is more efficient, but you've got to do what you've got to do and copper is expensive. So we're not going to all be running two gauge wire to everything. What I do advise is choose the largest wire that you can afford for things that use a lot of power. So they have a very small percentage of voltage drop. Your refrigerator is usually where like 90% of all your power goes to. So that should be wired very adequately. If you've got some little light that is in an engine compartment and only comes on occasionally, a 10% voltage drop is no big deal because it's just not gonna use much power over its lifetime. In another video, we're gonna go through a schematic of a boat, figure out like how the wires run and we'll do all that kind of thing. All I really wanna get into everybody's mind today is the idea of wire, wire gauge, how much current can put through it, and above all, how to protect yourself from burning down fuses and circuit breakers. So now we know a lot more about wire. Let's review. How'd you do? You can always go back and watch this video again. Uh, if you are rusty on Ohm's Law after the last episode, I do recommend you at least watch that and get it in your mind because that relationship becomes more and more important as we go through videos. So if every week or so you took a look at it, it would be doing yourself a favor. 
I hope you enjoyed this and keep on watching this series. We're going to get deeper and deeper and deeper until we can solve some very major problems. I'm hoping to go off into batteries. I'm hoping to go off into how to design your electrical system and how to wire your boat. And most importantly, how to find electrical faults in your boat. We're going to get to all those things in this series. If you enjoy it, please say thumbs up do all those things. The first video got very, very beautiful responses from you all. I really appreciate it. We didn't get huge numbers of watches, but it was okay. But the people who watched it, it was obvious from your comments that, that you enjoyed it and it made me want to do these. So thank you very much. Again, if you have friends you could share this series with, please do. There's always a playlist for all of the Emily and Clark's videos. So it behooves you just to go look at our list of playlists. If you like the capable cruiser guides, they're all in one place. If you like the adventure logs, they're all in one place. Well, now there's gonna be a place for this electrical series. If you're watching this years after I made it, lucky you, it's probably gonna be complete by then. For those of you watching it live, well, there'll be two in the list, but it'll grow. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed, because that's how you'll know when we put a new one out. And I really want to thank our patrons. We have a lot of people that are throwing some money our way every month. It keeps us inspired. It makes us feel like we're doing something useful, and I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Bye from Temptress.